Oh no, I see a sickle. Have you been told that you sickle in dance class? Well, there are many solutions other than just stop sickling. In this video, I'm going to go through all the different ways and reasons that you probably sickle in non-weight bearing. That means it's not the same as sickling on a rise. There's another video for that and I'll link that in the description below. But why do you think you might sickle when you pick your leg up to retire or attitude devant or just coup de pied derriere doing a petit jeté? Why do you sickle? Well, it's probably not just that you need to be stronger. And if you're sick of hearing that you just need to strengthen or pay attention more, then this video is for you. Make sure you watch right to the end so that you get to see all the different reasons that you might sickle. Thank you for watching. Please share it with other dancers. It's time we change the stigma of being a bad dancer just because you sickle. And it's equally time that we change the stigma that it's always just about becoming stronger. There's often a lot more to it. Enjoy this video that is an excerpt from a full program called To The Point Beyond Exercises that you can find more about, again, in the description below. And also, if you like this video, thanks so much for subscribing and supporting me on my journey to share all this really important information with dancers just like you. In today's terminology, we're following up with sickling. This time we are looking at all of the non-weight bearing times that you might sickle. Now, I hope you did a little write up of when you might have sickled. So if you didn't, we're gonna do that again right now. So in the previous one, we looked at sickling on a rise and all the common misunderstandings that might be there. Yes, there might be weakness in the outside, the perineal muscles outside of the shin there. There might be a stiff big toe at play and you've got some exercises and movements to do for both of those. Now, what about all the non-weight bearing? So that means when it's a gesture leg. So that would be things like your attitude devant, your retire, petit retire devant, petit retire derriere. How about if you did a point and flex? Thinking back to pointing your feet out in front of you like that sitting with the legs out. Did you sickle even when you were little back then? How about when you just do a tendu derriere? Maybe you don't get told you're sickling, but there might be something happening there. We're gonna look at all of those today. Okay, you get to follow along watching my feet and my descriptions at the same time. But first, just a little bit more. As with the weight bearing rises, a lot of it is misunderstandings. And in the case of non-weight bearing, a lot of it is because there's like a, a confusion that happens where it's these like competing ideas. Yes, I'm supposed to point my foot and I'm supposed to do this position or move it to this position, this place. And they get competing and the pointed foot that you might know and do a nice job just pointing your foot. But as soon as you add this and do a brush attitude devant, the pathway, the way you're thinking of getting into that takes precedent, takes priority, and confuses, and boom, suddenly the toes led you into a sickle. So we're gonna look at each of them individually because they're all different reasons. So let's go back to the very first time you might have done sickling. So you're five or six doing your point and flex. Now, if you, again, were told more about toes than anything else, maybe she even said to you or he said to you, all right, we're gonna do our point and flex and you sat down and did it and you extended your legs straight out of your hips as they're intended to be. And you heard, oh, feet together. Maybe you haven't put the idea of feet of being toes, arches and heels and ankles. And maybe it was just at toes because mostly when you think of feet, you think of your toes because I've got to point my toes. That makes me having good feet. And so with your legs and feet straight out, Maybe there's a gap. Feet together, maybe you put them together or maybe you did partly together, but maybe to finish it off, you brought your toes together. And so you sickled simply because our legs like to come straight out of our hips. That's how they're designed to do their purest hinging. So if you're sitting up in that L shape, you know, sitting up tall, legs out in front, all that good stuff, your legs are meant to be 
out of your hips. Now, if you're really tiny, you've got super narrow hips that might end up with your legs together. But as you get older, especially, and your hips get wider, or you had that build to begin with, your legs straight out of your hips, depending on the shape of your legs, your legs might be together. But I can tell you my thigh, let's, let's exaggerate here. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe my thigh is this wide, but my ankles are this wide. So if my thighs are together, it doesn't follow necessarily that as my legs taper down and get narrower and narrower, then my feet are going to be together. Now for young children growing and even teens still growing, but it's more common in the younger children, they have knobbly knees. The epicondyles, the ends of the long bones of the femur and the tibia that form the knee joint, are often quite big. It's almost like they got to grow into the knobs of their knees. Like when you look at a puppy that's got to grow into its big paws. <laughs> All right. So they're often quite big and knobbly and they make it so that when this dancer is trying to put their knees together, it's really hard and that they're definitely wider at the knees than they are at the ankles or toes. So what you got to do is that whole thing from before of the vacuum the reaching out, not veering in. So if they don't look at the fact that their knees are wider, but their ankles are narrower, then that means that if I'm keeping them in line, my knees are together, my shins won't touch, my ankles won't touch, my toes won't touch, unless I've told to put it together and didn't understand and went Doop, and sickled in. Now, maybe I need to, and I can, knobbly knees or not, activate some inner thigh muscles to actually pull together and narrow my legs out of the straight line, straight out of me, narrow them in so that my legs and feet are together. So as a teacher, I never say feet together. I say legs and feet together, which might therefore activate the narrowing of those inner thighs to draw the legs together. Maybe even a bit of tissue squishing so that I'm squished together enough that I've got this whole long center line between my legs right down through my ankle bones and my big toes and everything touches and is in line together. But that is certainly not possible for all body types or at all stages of development when the knees might simply be too knobbly. And even if they're pressing those thighs together, you can't press bone together any more than it's going to go. Right? So when you're asking yourself or dancers to have the feet together, do you really mean legs and feet together? In which case they have to narrow. That means you're not just pointing your legs and feet anymore. It's not a basic point and flex. It's complex. I've got my posture. And I might absolutely have activation of the adductors, right? The muscles bringing and narrowing together. So it's quite a few things I'm asking myself to do. Okay, it's not as simple as you might think to not sickle on a point and flex exercise. You have to look at your own legs. Can they be in a straight line and together? Mine can't. My thighs feel too big. I have to have a little gap between my ankles and therefore my toes. Unless I squish them together, in which case I'm actually now winging a little bit. Maybe okay to strengthen on the outside by winging that little bit, but I need to know that I'm winging instead of pretending it's a straight line when it's not. So check your own out. How are you with point and flex? When my knees are together, my legs and feet are a little bit apart. This is my knees together. Barely put my hand in, but there's space between my ankles and certainly my toes. If I tried to make them touch, I'd have to sickle. Or if I'm trying to make my ankles touch, for me, they actually won't. I can make my toes touch. So teacher's note, please, please, please make sure you don't make an offhand comment of feet together. Always. Look up the chain. Look to the line of the leg of the dancer you're looking at. Is that possible for them? Get down on your hands and knees. Help them feel their knees together. Maybe tapping on the inner thighs a little bit if you're allowed to touch there. To remind them that those muscles maybe are pulling together actively, continuously. Their knees touch. Oh, look, they have an inch space between their ankles. Oh, that's okay. Let's make it about reaching out. And you go and you do your double vacuum on them. Right, Aff, offhand comments, knees together, da da da. You might be correcting something because you weren't really clear with what you said. So you're wasting your time <laughs> when you try to be like 
quick with a comment if there's more explanation that's needed. Because if I'm quick with a comment and then poof, there becomes out of 10 kids, 10 different misinterpretations from that offhand quick comment. And now I've got to fix 10 different dancers with their issues. Maybe if I'd just taken time to be a lot more clear, especially when individuality of bodies shows up, I would have been fine and not needed to do that. Okay. Now, right in line with the point and flex is looking at whether you sickle in a parallel retire. So that would be a step hop or a skip, an axle turn maybe in jazz, or a big one would be a parallel pirouette in many dance forms. And even in the RED that I'm certified in, you're doing parallel releves and parallel pirouettes as far up as grade five, which I think is great. Now, in the previous one talking about the point and flex, I said, you know, your legs like to hinge straight in line with your hip joint. Now, while that's narrower than the actual width of your hips, it might also be wider than you think. So when I just hinge exactly where I need to be to pick my legs up in the most comfortable natural hinge, I know for me, and I've got quite wide hips, I have childbearing hips, yay, <laughs> that if I hinge my knee right in front of my hip, my leg, my picked up leg will not be touching my supporting leg. So. If you say to a student or you say to yourself, do a nice knee bend, fold at that hip. Oh, but keep your toe touching your supporting leg. I might fold. So let's say these are my hips. I might fold in line with my hip. And then if my center line is my center line here, and then I have to veer my toe in, in a sickle to touch my center line when really what I needed to do is realize that as I picked my leg up into that parallel retire, as I hinged my hip, it was not a pure hinge. It was a hinge with active narrowing, adduction, the adductors working, those inner thighs working. So it's again, it's more complex. Even starting with my feet together in parallel might be challenging depending on the knobs of my knees, so what I talk about is feeling like the squirrel runs up the tree. So the squirrel's at the base of the tree and your foot's the squirrel and it stays up the tree the whole time. What a lot of dancers do instead is they become what I call flying squirrels <laughs> where they pick up from the hip perspective and the knee perspective and then go, oh yeah, I'm supposed to make contact with the tree. And so I think of it as like the squirrel came up and then flew in to land onto the trunk of the tree. So it's got to be about narrowing from the beginning. So I do an exercise with students, even like 12 year old jazz students working on this, where we put our legs out in line with our hips and we hinge them in and out nice and straight, right in line with our hips. And then we do a narrow and then we let them release a narrow, let them release. Or then we do a narrow, keep it narrow, narrow, keep it narrow, or come up narrow, narrow, let release all those, re um, versions and then start doing it with the one leg to show the parallel retire when sitting. All of that helps to show that the reason they're sickling is because they're not using their adductors, because they're not clear that the pathway is more complex and is being dictated by the center line, not by the natural inclination of the hip joint to fold without adduction. You have to show them. You have to tell them. You have to be clear. If you're sickling in parallel retire, it's because you are not narrowing while you are picking your leg up. So be the squirrel running up the tree. This is my legs straight out from my hip and bent up right from my hip. You'll see that if I tried to touch my supporting leg with my toes, I'd have to sickle in. So for me to actually have my foot pointed and making contact between here and here. I can't just reach my toes. I would have to narrow this leg in and not just from the lower leg because that would turn me out. If I'm doing a parallel retire, then I'm not going to turn out. Now it wouldn't just be bringing this leg in. It would be bringing this leg in so that the center line of my body is met with my inner thighs. 
if both inner thighs are in line, then I can draw this leg up and keep parallel. That's that image of the foot being like a squirrel, not coming up and then flying in, but actually starting together and running up the tree. If I have my legs right in front of my hips and I just bend right in line with my hip, I would be here in space. If I then tried to remember to touch, I'd have to sickle. So instead of feeling the bend of my hip and then remembering to touch, I actually have to feel a narrowing action as I come up. So imagine I'd already narrowed and then I have to keep active the narrowing and actually run like that squirrel up the tree. I'm running up and running down. I'm actually feeling like a magnet on the inside of my big toe stays in line with the inside line of my leg. It does not feel like a pure hinge. It feels like a pure hinge that is being made more complex with a narrowing action. Now let's look at a tendu derriere. So let's say you're in third or fifth position. Now I'm not speaking about a tendu derriere in, at its completion or the degage position where it's fully extended back. You're probably not sickling there. If anything, you'd probably be winging if you have weight on it. And I just have to give a note, oh my gosh, watch out for any instructions that tell you to wing with weight on it. I saw a video, I'm not sure whether to link it, that feels helpful and also like I'm criticizing others. So I'm a little conflicted about that because um, I don't want to, I don't want to criticize anybody, but I also hope you understand that if you go to a tendu derriere and put weight on your back foot in order to press down and stretch the inside edge of your foot, first of all, you might be contributing to the creation of a bunion, a bunion but you're also now just stretching a structure without making it have anything to do with you having the strength of the outside shin muscles to create that shape. Use your strength to create the shape, not just collapsing and compressing into joints. I have no idea why this person thinks it's a good idea. Probably because, oh look, I got to stretch it and find this position. My suggestion to you, tendu derriere, take your leg off the floor like an inch, bat one glisse height, and if you want to wing, you got to start it there. You do not start it a tear on the ground. Now that's a wing. So now let's go to a sickle. Why might I sickle? If I'm tendouing derriere, I have to, this goes for all of them, but I really have to derriere. I have to do what I call ground and grow. I have to push down on the supporting leg in order to release enough weight so my back leg can start to go. If I'm losing any turnout. My heel will swing and start to go first. Oh, I now can start to find a bit of bending in a more familiar demi point position, as if the demi point was actually underneath me or part of, say, the journey with a tendu to second. But the demi point position on the way, or three quarter point position on the way to tendu derriere, is not at all going to feel or look or be in any way like it is when it's to second or like on a rise. It's not the same. It's its own unique pathway because I'm expecting myself to be in a demi point position with my leg going to the back. So a demi point position with my legs underneath me is this, but as soon as I'm on a diagonal because it's going to the back, these toes snap out of it, sorry. <laughs> then it's an entirely different angle that's being bent through. And if you're somebody that doesn't understand that, you might like the familiarity of I'm going through my feet and I can feel the pressure and I'm, it feels familiar and good. And therefore you'll be swinging your heel in a bit, pressing through the toes and still going to the back. And maybe my ankle's going further than my toes for a moment and I'm in a sickle. I, again, I may not finish there, but I'm practicing this weird sickle. Now, what do you do about it? Well, you make sure you put your weight down on your front foot. So I go ground and then I go. And here's the big thing. 
if I start feeling, putting, say, a hand at the top of my thigh and I feel my leg going to the back and my toes just sweeping with diminishing floor pressure, the amount of floor pressure I have when I'm close versus a little further and even further away, my floor pressure decreases on the out and increases on the in. If I try to keep my floor pressure the same because I think floor pressure is good, so therefore floor pressure is good, I must keep it the same all the time rather than. Well, it's in a context. It's like me saying toes, all toes on the floor all the time. Well, not on a rise. All right. Floor pressure changes. Floor pressure cannot be as much supporting leg, brushing leg cannot be as much here as it would be here. Here, it's more vertical. It's got more body weight able to come down onto it. So I need to let it kind of brush and sweep. I feel them sweeping away. So for tendre derriere, I must start with my leg going and close with my leg. The toes get to sweep out first. Yes, you might hear that. But what I have to really do is let go of as much floor pressure, which requires me to turn in in order to find. Okay, so then I'm losing my turnout. And again, maybe my heel's still going back and, and there's sort of a fight between turning the toes in, but the heel's still going back and that's gonna cause a sickle. All right, so it's a little bit about turnout, misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding about floor pressure. It might be that I'm not um, very grounded on my supporting leg before I go. And as an interesting note, the way to be grounded on your supporting leg is to be reaching through your heel, not just be on the ball of your foot. So for a tendu derriere, I have to push down on my front leg so that this leg can start to slide back properly. If I don't push down on this leg, as I start to go, I might still put a lot of pressure here. The only way to have any real pressure in the back foot is to have actually turned it in a little bit. Now it can take some weight. If I was actually in my true stroking back fashion where I'm on this diagonal line through my big toe, that diagonal line cannot really support weight very easily. And it most certainly feels foreign if you're learning it. So as I go back, I push down on my supporting leg so that I can start to move my leg back and brush through and not lead with my toes. That would also lose turnout. Here's where the sickle happens. My heels going back, but I want to bend my toes. And by toes, I mean feeling the familiarity of bending between big toe and second toe, but my heel's still going back, so I sickle. A good way to show your students about the different contact points so that they do not attempt to make the wrong demi point is to do a rise where they feel, whether it's turned out or parallel, the bend between the big toe and second toe so that I know I'm in line. Now that position here is only the same if I was in demi point devant parallel, or if I was in demi point in second, turned out. As soon as I'm demi point devant, the contact point is different. If I tried to make it feel the same, I'd have to go parallel. The contact point can be the same in second, but again, as soon as I go derriere, it changes. And if I tried to keep it the same, I'd have to go parallel. And often that somewhat going parallel with the heel going back is where people start to sickle when they go back. And then they finish their toes in one big sweep. A good exercise to do to help dancers feel this would be to take a rond de jambe, but to keep the foot on demi point so they can feel the contact points. So I do my nice brush through and finish just demi point, feeling that diagonal line, feeling the familiar where I'd be if I did a rise and feeling the diagonal. Let's now look at retire, in particular retire devant. Like I was going to do a développé devant or for sure doing like a pirouette en dehors. So are you somebody that sickles in pirouette position? I know that was something I was guilty of and I was guilty of it for a couple of reasons. Here's my reason, maybe it was yours. 
I got a lot of instruction about turnout to push my thighs backwards. That's not correct. It's about rotation. And when the thigh bones rotate, they happen to move more to the side. But I didn't get that. I got more about just, you know, people coming and pushing my thigh back. Now, when you do a retire, it's really easy to do that. You've got your toe in front, you know, it's got some leverage so I can put my toe on my supporting leg and just crank that thigh back. And then in a pirouette, let's say on Dior, the cranking of the thigh back also looked like it was great to help create the turn. It's also great throwing your weight back. Okay, so that doesn't work, but it's super common. Now, let's look at why. Again, it would be because somebody told you to push your thigh back. So when you're looking at even doing a basic plie, are you asking yourself to push your thighs back? Please stop doing that. Instead, you're going to ask yourself to rotate your legs. And when I rotate my legs, perhaps they move back. But that's not the same as pushing back. So how do you know if you have that habit? If you're somebody that had the correction a lot, particularly, let's say, grand plie in first, or even a demi plie in second, where you kept noticing or getting correction that your pelvis kept shifting back a lot. Now, your pelvis does shift back in a grand plie in second, based on how much flexibility you have at the front of the hips. But a demi plie in second should be able to have the sits bones like little arrows down between our supporting legs. If you're somebody that always moved it back, that tells you that it's probably because as you pushed your thighs back, it took your pelvis back with you and that you were having this fight between keeping your pelvis where it was supposed to be pushing your thighs back. Okay. Um, I would go back to doing the squat assessment and practicing your squatting to help a little bit more working on the changing of the pelvis to be able to allow for that rotation. I would go back to doing the glute tapping, you know, where you're doing your light fist on your butt as you swing your leg forward and back to be able to open up in there and get rotation instead of shove backwards. Okay, so now here's sort of the misunderstanding piece of it. So when I'm on a straight leg, if I'm rotating my straight leg, let's just say it's my pen, I'm rotating it. So let's say there's the, um, the little extended part of the cap and I rotate it back. Well, I could be thinking of as on a straight line that whether I'm talking about my thigh let's say, or my lower leg, they're both rotating the same way. Yeah, so I could be thinking of my rotation in a very linear, less complex way. Everything rotates that way. But as soon as I bend my knee, now I've got something that rotates that way. But now this knee bending, it goes from, I hope this makes sense, because they both rotated back, but as soon as I bend, this one's now rotating forward. Okay, sorry, let me do that again. These both rotate back, but when I bend my knee, they, this one now rotates back, but this one is rotating forward. It becomes separate. Rotate back with a straight leg. They both got the same information. I could shove back to my heart's content and it'll work. But if I rotate back when this knee is supposed to come forwards, or sorry, when this knee bends, and this now rotates forwards as part of its rotational line. Maybe I'm not doing that. I've just got everything back as if there was like wind in my sails and the wind in my sails took back my shin, which therefore takes back my heel and therefore I have a sickle. Because the reality is I'd be rotating in a sense backwards away from the front in my thigh, but I'm rotating towards the front in my shin and therefore my heel supporting me in a way that won't sickle when I've got a bent leg. So the misunderstanding would be that there's a difference between, um, or not knowing that there's a difference between the directions of where the rotation goes when I've got a straight leg versus when it's a bent leg. The thigh maintains, but the lower leg goes from either back with a thigh or forward opposite to the thigh. Back with a thigh, forward opposite to the thigh. So I would practice frappe fouette, where I'm just coming in and out, okay, and I'm keeping my ankle nice and strong, whether I'm coming in front or in back, but I'm feeling that, oh yeah, if I put a ribbon around to show the turnout, ooh, directionally forwards by the time I'm coming to the front. And really, thinking something backwards, something forwards is actually confusing. 
because they're opposites. Now, I know I said at one point we learn through opposites, but wouldn't it be better just to feel rotation? No opposites. It's rotation. I just rotate down the whole leg. And there happens to be a spatial pull backwards or forwards, or maybe this would be one time I wouldn't talk about a spatial pull. I talk about just the rotation. And the reason I get rid of spatial pull is because the spatial pull that most people do is pulling backwards. And then it pulls backwards in your shin and pulls backwards in your heel. Hello, you have a sickle. I hope that all makes sense. Okay, so the remedy would be to do some frappe fuetes and to start thinking of rotation instead of, well, I don't actually say turnout. I talk about rotation. Turnout tends to mean out from the center of the body. And so we can't help but have this almost on deor action, right, of going outwards. And oh, as soon as I go outwards, oh, it also starts to go backwards. And I start to think of my turnout that way. So I think of it instead as rotation. And I try my languaging to be rotation. And I'd encourage you or invite you to try that as well and see what that brings you. Now we're going to look a little bit at pirouette position. As I bring my foot up, I can be feeling the rotation around this way, which could be directionally backwards. But as I go, I have to be feeling the rotation in my calf muscle, what would be considered directionally forwards. If I didn't do that and I felt backwards and backwards, it would pull my heel back into the sickle. So it's better to be thinking of rotation that keeps happening all the way down the leg to support the heel, rather than backward and possibly backward. That again, pulls my weight back and would throw my heel down. What you don't want to be doing is fixing it by thinking backward which made my heel go and then press my heel forward. That is different than actually activating the rotation of the calf forward. And we want the rotation of the calf forward. Good exercise to practice. Good exercise to practice would be a frappe fuete where I feel my rotation here and maintain. Here, maintain. No matter what I'm doing, I'm feeling the same rotation. And you can discuss with the students the difference between when I spiral, it can go backwards in upper and lower. And when I spiral, but come into retire, if I wanted to label directions other than rotation, it would be a backwards and then a, a forwards. I believe in spatial pulls, but not in retire. It's a major cause of sickling. So often a sickle in retire is because dancers are pushing their thigh back. That's what Lily's showing with her left hand. If the thigh is pushing back, then the heel often gets the same message to push back. Okay, now it's complicated to push back with one and forward with one. That's opposition all ideas, and sometimes that's very confusing. Okay, so Lily, go ahead and push her heel forward, her thigh back and heel forward. A um, little bit more down at her actual heel, not her ankle, but her heel. Yeah, so she's trying to not be sickled. Yeah, so that's the common correction. But what would be even better, Claire, can you go ahead and extend your leg, please? And Lily, you're going to help her stay with a bit of rotation. Give her a little bit of support for rotation. Let's square up your hips a bit more, Claire. And I see you hanging on for dear life there. Can you just <laughs> There you go. Okay, so help her with a bit more turnout there. And then give her a little bit more of a lift so we can do a retire. And then keep the same rotation as you bend. So all you're doing is bending your knee, bending your knee into retire, but you keep the same rotation. Yeah, so it's about feeling rotation instead of pressing backwards. Yes.